In this lecture, we're going to discuss three important concepts. We're going to look at rate of our reaction, we're going to look at rate constant of our reaction, as well as first and second order reactions, as well as give a few examples of such reactions that we already spoke about. So, let's begin by looking at the following reaction. Let's suppose we have some reactants reacting a certain way to produce our products. And this is our energy diagram for our reaction taking place. So, the x-axis is our reaction progress going this way, and this y-axis is our change in H, change in enthalpy. Recall that change in enthalpy is simply the difference in the bond energies between the product and reactants. So notice from this energy diagram that the products are more stable than reactants. Well, how do we know? Well, because the products are lower on the y-axis than the reactants. And that means if we take products and subtract reactants from products, we get a negative delta H. And that means our bonds in the product are more stable than the bonds in reactants. And so because they're more stable, because our products are more stable than reactants, that means equilibrium will lie towards the right side, towards the product side, because the fact that our products are more stable. So a very important point must be made. Equilibrium is not the same thing as a rate. So a lot of the times we say, because something is more stable, that means our reaction occurs at a quicker rate. That's actually not true. So equilibrium basically talks about the stability of our products versus our reactants. So if our products are more stable, that means our equilibrium will lie towards the more stable side, towards the product side. But the rate of the reaction is only related to the transition state. That transition state tells us how quickly our reaction will take place. The energy of the transition state determines how quickly our reaction takes place. The amount of energy to surmount that transition state is known as the activation energy. In other words, the only way that reactants will actually become products is if the reactants gain enough energy to surmount, to climb this activation barrier, this energy to reach the transition state. Remember, in order to get from reactants to products, we have to undergo the transition state. Now, the transition state is something that cannot be isolated. It cannot be examined in the same way that reactants and products can. And that's because the transition state is an energy maximum. It has a very high energy, and so it will not exist for a very long time. So, what must take place for our reaction to actually occur? So, two important things must occur. First, the reactants must collide with the products, and they must have enough kinetic energy during that collision to climb this activation barrier, to reach this transition state. And the second thing that must happen is that when they make that collision, they have to collide in a, at a certain angle, in a certain way. So for example, let's look at these two reactants. They have to collide at a certain angle, in a certain way, with a certain amount of energy. And if all that happens, we will form our products, we will form our new bonds. So let's examine the following diagram. In this diagram, the y-axis is the number of molecules, the number of our reactants, and the x-axis is the kinetic energy of our molecules, of our reactants. So notice that this uh, apex, this uh, hill here, represents the average number of molecules that have a certain kinetic energy. And this line here represents the activation energy. So notice that in this situation, most of the molecules don't actually have enough energy to climb this energy barrier because this energy is so high. Now, how do we actually get these molecules, get more molecules 
to reach this activation barrier. Well, let's talk about rate constant. So what exactly is rate constant? So rate constant is not the same thing as rate of reaction. These two concepts are related, but they're not the same thing. And let's see why. So let's suppose we have a first order reaction and we'll see what that means in a second. So our rate law or rate of reaction is equal to K times our concentration of our reactants. Now K is known as our rate constant. Okay, and this is known as our rate of reaction. So rate of our reaction is directly related to our constant. If our constant is higher, then our rate will also be higher, assuming the concentration of reactants is also the same. So this equation, known as the Arrhenius equation, it gives us the rate constant of our reaction. So K is equal to A, which is known as the steric factor, E to the E negative EA divided by RT. So T is the temperature in Kelvin, R is our gas constant, E to the A, or E subscript A, is simply our activation energy, and A is our steric factor that essentially depends on the orientation of our molecules and the frequency with which our molecules collide. Now notice that the rate constant depends on the specific reaction at hand. Different reactions have different rate constants. Now, and this rate constant, according to our equation, is related to two important things. It's related to temperature as well as activation energy. So when we increase the temperature, we actually increase the rate constant according to this equation. And what actually happens is, by increasing the temperature of our reaction, our reactants have more kinetic energy to collide. And so when we increase temperature, we shift this entire hill towards the right so that more molecules are able to surmount this activation barrier. So, notice that the only time that our rate of reaction will, will actually equal the rate constant is when the concentration of all the reactants that go to the rate law is zero. So if this is a first order reaction, and reacting concentration is 1, that means plugging in 1, we get rate equals K. So this is the only time that our, that our rate constant will equal to our rate of reaction. So, let's discuss two very common uh, reactions that take place in organic chemistry. Now, other reactions exist, but they're more rare. So let's discuss the first and second order reaction. So we already spoke about both types. When we spoke about the SN1 reaction in which we had the first step, the slow step, the ionization step in which the leaving group departed forming our carbocation, and the second step, the fast step, in which the nucleophile was captured or the carbocation was captured by the nucleophile to produce our product. So the slow step is the rate determining step. When we wrote our rate law for SN1 reaction, we saw that our rate is independent of the nucleophile concentration. It only depends on our substrate. And this is known as the first order reaction because only one thing, one concentration goes into our rate law. So K times concentration of substrate, in this case it's this guy here. Now let's discuss the SN2 reaction. The SN2 reaction, as we saw, is the second order reaction because it depends on both the concentration of substrate as well as the concentration of nucleophile. Increasing either of these concentrations will increase the rate of our reaction, but the constant K will not increase. The concentrations increasing or decreasing the concentrations will do nothing to the rate constant because the rate constant is related to this equation.